Well, hello and thank you. Um, first of all, um, Alex has not told you the full story. This is now a completely valid Rust program, and you actually don't need to program anything anymore. You can just have everything generated. Um, we just lost our jobs. Um, so who am I? I'm Florian. Um, there's Twitter and company links on this slide. Um, I'm here for Mozilla, actually. Um, Mozilla sent me here as a, uh, a part of the Tech Speaker program. And this is actually my second time I'm on this stage. I was here before at RubyConf uh, Uruguay, um, giving my, I was 10 years in the Ruby community talk. Um, now I'm five years in the Rust community, something like that. And I met a lot of familiar faces. I'm happy to be here again. Um, I started Rust in 2015, mostly out of personal curiosity. And because I'm not a good solo learner, I immediately started the Berlin User Group, which is uh, one of the biggest and most active around the globe. Um, I'm organizing two Rust conferences, Rust Fest and Oxidize Conf. I can heavily emphasize with how much and how much of a great job this is um, having that. And I'm a product member since 2015, mostly in the community team. And um, now also moving to other spaces. And I can definitely um, agree with Nico that the Rust project is very, very easy to join on all positions. Um, if you have something that specifically, this is specifically of your interest, it's very, very easy to get in touch with people and um, get involved. Um, and this is also my first talk on a Rust conference. Uh, I've organized them. I have never given a talk at a Rust conference. Um, and what I want to do is I want to make you competent at reading and writing where clauses because they are important, but have some subtleties to understand. So just as a bit of background, what is a where clause? Let's say we have a pretty simple data type. We have a point. Point has an x and a y value, and we have a function that's called print point that just takes a reference to that point and prints it out. Like nothing important. The most important thing here is this point implements debug because our println macro requires things that we print out using the call question mark syntax. Sorry. Um, it requires them to be debug. But this version of this function just takes a bare point. So what if I have squares? So I have a square. It has an x and y position and a width. Um, that's enough to describe a square. And I can write a print square function uh, that takes a square and just does exactly the same thing. Um, that's very repetitive. And computers are very good at repetitive. Uh, we are not as good as computers here. And the unifying thing between these two is not that they're shapes. For the printing function, what we need is actually that both of them implement the debugging representation um, by using the derived debug statement up there. So we can rewrite that function as fn print takes a shape s, takes a borrow of the shape s, and prints it out. But the important thing is we need to indicate to the compiler in some way um, that we only accept types that we can actually turn into this debug representation. That we do using the where clause. So we put there where s is debug. Um, the thing under number three is called um, the trade bound. And the thing under number one is called a trade variable, or a, a type variable, sorry. So now we can both create a point and a square and use both, print both of them out using print. The important part here is the first statement, the first print statement internally calls a function that's called something like print point and the second something like print square. The important thing here is those are actually different functions. The compiler just generates them for us. Logically speaking, there's an infinite number of those. There's an infinite number of those functions for every type that is debug. But in case of this program, we actually only compile two. So um, for Rust, for, from Rust's point of view, those functions will be compiled on need. We are actually using print point. We are actually using print square. These two are needed. These two are going to be generated. There are other places where the um, where clause can be stated. For example, we can create a struct that is generic, that inside has two some things. 
preferably numbers if we're representing a point. Um, and we can also say P needs to be debugged. Most of the stuff that's important you can totally um, exercise on functions though. Um, a bit more detail here. So we have a function that takes, that has two generics T and E. Um, and I can express what I want from them. First of all, what the where function, uh, the where clause gives me over any kind, or over the other shorthand syntax is that I can split it up. So it can state bounds multiple times. I can say, I want T to implement a trait called trait and a trait called other trait. Or I could have another type E that implements trait plus other trait. So I can do both of these. Um, that's functionally the same, but for ordering your code, it just helps a lot. Um, the important thing in the where clause is the left things are concrete types. So what this says is I have a function and for every pair of, um, of types, T and E, that fulfill um, the bounds to the right, um, there are, I can compile this function for any two exact types. Um, before, because the left hand is an actual type, this, for example, works. I can say I have a function takes into string t, where string, which is the standard string of the Rust libra library, implements from t. So I can say I take any kinds of types that can be turned into a string in that way. Where classes are important for a couple of reasons. For example, they are the way how we can, for example, um, constrain on the type that an iterator returns us. So again, using just the bare debug trait and printing stuff out to the console, um, I can have a function called debug eater that takes any kind of iterator. The iterator trait is, again, standard eta iterator, but it has an associated type, which is the item that it's going to return. I don't know what the item is, but using the where clause, I can at least say the item must be in the set of types that do implement debug and that can be printed to the console. And to my knowledge, that was also one of the arguments why the where clause was actually introduced to be able to actually do this. So there's a couple of patterns on how we can work with that. Um, so when I do generic programming, um, I'm always talking about this idea of constraints. And for example, if we take as ex uh, some of the standard library types, for example, result, result being either this worked and it gives me result back, that's the okay variant of the uh, result enum, or it gives me an error back. Um, that doesn't give me a lot. And if you have a look at the standard library implementation of result, um, there's a couple of functions defined on this. There's actually a lot of functions de uh, um, defined on this type. And the most basic ones are, for example, here, the implementation for any kind of um, result value or error. I have two functions, is OK or is error, just, that just tell me which of the variants that was. That does need no knowledge about what T and E actually are. But if I want to call unwrap, for example, if I have result unwrap, I'm going to have a panic message that includes the debug representation of my error that I had. And there, I have an implementation that says impl te result te, where e is debug, and then there's a couple of functions that rely on error actually being debuggable. The other way around, there's implementations for if t, the value when, when everything worked, if t implements default, so it has a default value, result gains a function that's called unwrap or default, which doesn't panic, but instead, in case of an error, gives me the default value back. So we are gradually constraining the result type more, and the more we know about it, the more functions get unlocked on it. And gradually unlocking features based on these kinds of bounds is a common API strategy in Rust, and you can see that all through the standard library. Let's talk 
about another piece of standard library, which is the threading API. Um, I, have a thre uh, I have an example here that does, again, something rather useless. I have a vector, and I spawn a thread, which takes that vector and counts the elements of it and gives me the result back. The threading API is generic because I can push anything inside and get anything back. So, coming up with a first attempt at writing that on my own, you could come up with something like this. Um, you have the thread spawn function. It takes an F and a T type, takes in the F, returns me the T. Um, why is it F? Wait a second. Um, thread spawn takes a closure, runs that closure, includes all the data that my clo uh, close over, in this case the vector, and returns me whatever that closure has actually returned as the join handle. The join handle will give me information of has that, run, uh, has that thread actually run to completion, was there an error or whatever, but it gives me the result value back. The problem is um, what fits these slots? What can I put into that F and that T? Problem there is threads, if I'm spawning a thread, a classic problem is all the data that is put on that thread should preferably not reference anything out of the context where the thread was spawned in. Why? Because both are going to, to, to run in parallel and the data in the first part might be removed, changed, whatever, and is independent of the second. So I want to have this idea that Nico introduced uh, today, today in the morning of actually giving complete packages over and also getting complete packages back and forcing the, um, um, forcing the programmer to actually move everything over and not half of it. The problem is, if I would write the API like this, that were actually possible because I have not any, I have no other constraints on F and T than that they're actually generic types that might be, they might end up being references, they might be any kind of valid ROS type. So what I can do, I can use um, the, where, the where clause here to express additional things here and a way of expressing what I just said, you can actually send that stuff over to a thread Rust has a marker for that. Rust has a marker for everything that is actually allowed to do that traveling. That's called send. And the other thing is I can bound this value with a special lifetime that is called tick static. And the bound, any type plus tick static, essentially means it must own all data. So you can give up complete ownership like the party that spawns the thread must give up complete ownership of all the data, of all the payload it puts on the thread. And after the thread is done, we want to remove it and throw it away. We also need to have the ability to bring everything back that you want to bring. So this F send plus static bound expresses this quite neatly. Um, there was an issue um, in my teaching in like two or three years ago that people felt like expressing plus tick static is cheating because you don't take part in the references game. It's actually a meaningful statement. If you don't want to deal with references, if you don't want to deal um, with borrows, just express tick static and that's probably a very valid solution to your problem and just deal with ownership. Another problem that might arise um, when you start working with where clauses and um, start trying out bounds is we often have wrapper types. And wrapper types sometimes express some kinds of um, expectancies over what you put inside. Here again, I have a wrapper, and again, again just using the debug trait as, a, as an example trait. Now I have a, another function that takes that wrapper and just unwraps it and takes the inner part. But because I have expressed that wrapper only can, can only have types with a certain bound inside, 
if I want to write take inner, I also, to fulfill that, I also always have to constrain the generic type or the generic variables of take inner as debug. The function itself doesn't actually use it though. So that's a problem. I'm, I, ha I want to try, I want to write this function. It just does nothing more than taking that structure, taking out what's in, ever inside. But I do have to express an additional bound just to basically reiterate that wrapper already um, expects the inner part to be debugged and nothing else is allowed. So what can I do against that? There's a pattern in which you can write this wrapper in a way that it actually itself can contain any type, but you can effectively only create that wrapper in a fashion um, where it is debugged. Let's just zoom in here. The way it works is you don't, cons you don't allow users to directly construct the type, and you're only giving them a constructor, and that constructor carries the bound that I want to express. The, what you can then do is later, if you actually want to use this bound, for example, by putting in an, putting an inspect method on that wrapper, um, you just need to restate it. But because the compiler actually follows all those variables through the whole program, it will still know the thing you put into the wrapper was a type that is debug, and no one can effectively create any of those wrappers that, um, that don't have this bound at all. Which, um, I can refactor this in, the, in, in a way by actually putting that bound again on the implementation instead of, um, uh, instead of on all the functions themselves. That's for you to decide how you want to do this. But this allows me to write the take inner function in a way where I, do, I have to express this bound because at that point, I don't care about it. It's absolutely not needed. So where classes are primary refactoring targets. If you want to change your program and make it more flexible, more constrained, depending on what your goal is, your where classes are your primary refactoring target. Uh, also, don't start out extremely generic. Like, don't try to write generic code out of the blue. The pattern that I've shown in the beginning, figuring out that two or three functions are basically the same and you probably can move them into, um, into a generic function uh, is a very useful one. Probably the thing that I've shown in the beginning, you, that's something you could write immediately, but any kind of more complex system, start simple, start building up, start building into the generic, uh, into genericness. Also, the, finding the right level is important, though that's a classic in programming. Um, a lot of application programming, like outer edge application programming, suffers from the fact that people try to do it to make it too generic. So, um, but for library authors, for giving flexibility and for communicating intent to the outside, um, this is very useful. So always be aware where you are and whether that's actually needed. And in the end, you might up, end up writing terrible clauses like this. Um, this is from my, one of my current projects. I'm going to refactor that tomorrow. <laughs> it's literally a work in progress. <laughs> okay. Uh, some advanced examples. Um, trait bound, uh, traits and bounds can be used to express relationships between types. And this becomes very useful. Um, this is one of my favorite Twitter accounts. It's called uh, Happy Automata, or um, Vaguely Reassuring State Machines. It generates state machines like this. And um, I would like to write one of those state machines myself. And state machines usually have states. Some of those states are terminals. Um, I skipped having start tr uh, states in this example just because that would be rote and would just make the example bigger. But what I can have is I can write, for example, two traits, the first one being transition to S, another state, express in the work class S needs to be a state, self also needs to be a state, so I can make a statement about the, the type that this trait is going to be implemented on, and give that 
a function called transition, and transition will take the current state, actually owning and thereby destroying it, um, and return the next state. And another trait, terminate, that can only be called on terminal states that just removes the state machine, calls it done. And I can create myself three states. Um, the state machine that I'm creating here is basically, uh, there's a start, there's a mid state that I can actually loop into again, and then there's an end. So I have start, loop, and stop. I implement state for them. This is actually an empty trait. It's just a marker to, the, to make the compiler know these types are states. There's no, I gain no functionality from that. And stop is actually the terminal state. That's where I'm ending. And then I can implement transition to loop from start. I can go from loop to start. Transition to loop for loop, so I can go back into it again. Um, transition to, from, um, to end for loop. Sorry, there's an error on the slide. And um, implement terminate for end, so I can actually call. Um, so I can actually stop. That means I cannot terminate that state machine if I have not ended up in the end state. So I need to make sure that people uh, actually that the users of the state machine actually follow through and take this process to the end. The code here is simple. This is one pattern on how to write this. There's a whole blog post on this by a community member called Hoverbear. Um, and the setup and the programming of this is a little involved, but the usage is rather straightforward. The reason why I have to type the left side so I need to actually express what the next state is going to be is exactly because I have this loop state where I can either loop again or go to the end state. And this is something where I actually have to tell the type checker I intend to be this, this to be the next state. The two comments in the middle, those wouldn't compile. So if I would try to terminate while I'm still in the loop state, that doesn't work because loop doesn't implement terminate. Um, and if I would try to transition from uh, the loop state again to start, that doesn't work. Um, this, that's just not defined. Um, yeah. uh, second example that comes also out of my work is how about like talking about what is stored in databases. Let's say I have a storage trait. Um, my storage can be queried, for example, for a model. Uh, that takes the storage by that both the storage, but um, I also give it an ID, so it, um, it takes the storage and reads out the model under this ID. The problem with this definition is I could try to get anything out of that. I could try to read strings, vectors, mutexes, whatever, because every type is valid to fill that variable, and this is what constraining gives me constrained to the things that are meaningful. And I can define a code trait here that says stores model. And I can also constrain the stores model trait to it can only be, only be implemented on storages. Then I can extend my function with where self actually stores that model. And now I've defined a function that communicates. You can try to query models out of this but only if it actually stores them. And you force the implementer to actually declare what's stored here, to declare that to the compiler. So for example, I can have a user's database. This user's database implements storage by, what do I know, an SQLite back database, Postgres or whatever. I have a user model um, and for example, another avatar model, so they can have users and the avatars in the same database. And then I implement, implement stores user and implements stores avatar for users database. And this becomes pretty natural. It, so having, you can only query things where the storage actually stores. And in the end, I have things, I can write, write a program that while down looks like this, um, I can have, I can connect to my database, and I can try to query it. Um, I actually have to state at this point what model I actually want to query out of it. So here the type checker won't help me because I've actually said I want to have multiple options and I need to decide. So I'm saying query 
a user out of that database. But if I would try to query a string out of it or any kind of other type, it would tell me, no, I actually don't store this. Um, the error message in this case would be um, that the storage actually doesn't implement. Um, the function exists, but it doesn't implement the, um, the right bounds. So the conclusion out of all, uh, all of this, um, getting comfortable with all the stuff that where clauses give you is important. Take it slow though, so don't start writing big ones just right out of the door. Um, exactly picking which constraints to need where is key and spending some time on actually figuring out what you need potentially over constraining first later maybe removing some of the constraints may help um, there's also an API concern around this if you further constrain um, a where clause you are breaking your previously committed API if you're widening it if you're allowing more people to call it or this to be called with more types you're not breaking your external API and there are creative patterns of interplay with which you can um, start declaring to the compiler how your systems work um, to be found in all that. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. <laughs>